Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. Here at the end of the year, court has sure been busy with two moms who uh, are sitting in custody this holiday season. Ruby Frankie has pled guilty. We're going to talk about that plea hearing, what we learned, what a little bit about what the plea agreement said and what happens next when she comes before the court in February for sentencing. And then Donna Adelson has some real interesting jail calls that I think the prosecutors are going to absolutely use against her. It's been a long time since I've sat down and listened to a jail call, but I think you'll find some of the things she talks about quite interesting, and those are going to play in to her prosecution for the murder of Dan Markell. So those are the things we're talking about today, but this holiday season, you can nourish your body with Green Chef. The flavorful meals are made with clean ingredients to make eating clean even easier. Get 60% off Green Chef plus 20% off your first two months with code 60 Emily Baker at greenchef.com slash 60 Emily Baker. Thank you, Green Chef, for A, making sure I always have dinner and B, being an incredible partner on this show. Let's get in to today's episode. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Last week on the show, we gave a quick update on Ruby Frankie because the waiver hearing had popped onto calendar for today as I record this, but December 18th, um, a few days as you are listening to this episode, because it seemed that she was going to at least waive her preliminary hearing. And I speculated at that time that there might be a plea agreement in the works. There had been months since the arrest without any preliminary hearing and no waiver of preliminary hearing. And we had not seen anything come up on the court docket. The case had a whole bunch of activity at the very beginning and then silence. So I was speculating that they might be working out a plea deal and there's a lot of reasons to not go forward with a preliminary hearing if a plea deal is in the works. Then on Friday, December 15th, Ruby Frankie's lawyers put out a very interesting PR statement that indicated she would be taking a plea deal. We're gonna go through that PR statement today and then we are going to go through just a little bit of Ruby Frankie's hearing from December 18th what the plea deal looks like on the court documents. I am not going to be getting into the details shared in the court documents. You can find those if you are interested in them. That has already been posted all across the internet and reported pretty widely. It is really horrific and sad instances consistent with not only what we heard on the 911 call, but going into even more detail. I will mention that somewhat vaguely, but we will talk about what this plea deal means and go forward. I do go through that a bit more thoroughly. Over on my YouTube channel, I streamed the video of the hearing and covered it and then covered that in more detail. So today is more a legal overview than getting into all of those facts. And even there, I definitely kept it um, a bit at a higher level instead of getting into every detail, just because it is really just horrific um, admissions of abuse, but we're going to talk about that after we talk about her lawyer's statement. This is a statement from KSL TV from Ruby Frankie's criminal defense law firm. A very interesting statement given what we know today. This came out Friday before her plea deal was entered into on Monday. Today that I'm recording but Monday when you're listening. Linward Law is making a statement on behalf of Ruby Frankie regarding the pending charges in the Washington County 5th District Court along with her thoughts about her current family situation. Because when you're ready to plea, of course, we want her thoughts on her current family situation. It goes on to say our client is working with the prosecutor's office and anticipates resolving this matter quickly by entering a plea agreement with the court on Monday, December 18th, which she has done and we will be talking about next. It goes on to say Ruby Frankie is a devoted mother and is also a woman committed to constant improvement. Initially, Ms. Frankie believed that Jody Hildebrandt had the insight to offer a path to continual improvement. Ms. Hildebrandt took advantage of this quest and twisted it into something heinous. Over an extended period, Ms. Hildebrandt systematically isolated Ruby Frankie from her extended family, older children, and her husband, Kevin Frankie. 
This prolonged isolation resulted in Miss Frankie being subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Miss Hildebrandt's influence. Interesting that they call Kevin Frankie her husband. We now know he's filed for divorce. I guess they are estranged, but still referencing him as the husband. Ruby Frankie is saying that all of the abuse that happened to her children are because somehow Jody Hildebrandt hijacked her. It goes on to say that during Ruby Frankie's incarceration in Washington County Jail over the past few months, she is actively engaged in an in introspection that has allowed her to reset her moral compass. Okay. And understand the full weight of her actions. Miss Frankie is committed to taking responsibility for the part she played in the events leading up to her incarceration. Your children were significantly and substantially abused. So the part you played in the events leading up to your incarceration were abusing your children and allowing someone else to abuse your children. Demonstrating a sincere dedication to personal growth and rehabilitation, she has actively begun the process by reaching out to members of her family. I wonder how that has gone. But it seems that her sisters and parents were in court for her plea hearing and were speaking at least a little bit with her defense attorney before the court hearing began. It says through heartfelt apologies, she seeks to mend relationships and contribute positively to the healing journey of her family. Ruby is aware that Kevin Frankie has filed for divorce, so I imagine that these are Ruby Frankie's statements on her family situation or her thoughts. Ruby is aware that Kevin Frankie has filed for divorce. While she is devastated by this news, she acknowledges and understands his anger and reasoning. Despite the pain, she respects his decisions and remains hopeful that with time, she can contribute to rebuilding trust and fostering understanding within their family. I don't know if the kids are going to see it that way, and I hope that Kevin Frankie's first inclination is to protect their children. Though I also hope that Ruby Frankie will have a, a good bit of time away from the family, that she will serve in prison. We are going to talk about that in a minute. It goes on to say, Ruby has offered her full cooperation to help the children reunite with their father. I'm imagining that this indicates that she will not be actively participating in the family court proceedings that are ongoing, or at least not arguing that Kevin shouldn't have the children and that she believes the children should be with Kevin. I don't know after admitting to child abuse, to four counts of child abuse, how the family court is going to receive her input or if they want to receive her input at all. But the criminal plea does not automatically terminate her parental rights. She still has, at this point, parental rights. Where the children will be in custody is a different thing. What the family court does from here after this plea agreement is a separate thing. And the statement ends, y'all take a deep, deep breath, an inhale and an exhale to deal with the frustration that I am bringing to you. The statement ends with, Windward Law recognizes the profound love that Miss Frankie holds for her children. And we are genuinely saddened that she found herself on this challenging path under the influence of Miss Hildebrandt. It is our firm belief that Miss Frankie is a devoted mother who unfortunately was led astray. She is sincere in her commitment to securing the best possible future for her family, and we remain hopeful that with the right support and understanding, she can navigate a path to healing and growth. She talks very little in this statement, or her lawyers talk very little in this statement about her children. She talks a lot about herself and a lot about the fact that she found herself on a road under the influence of her co-defendant and that in fact she deeply loves her children and the horrific abuse that they suffered was all because she was led astray by someone else. She is a 41 year old woman and she will be serving prison time 
for the four counts that she pled to. So let's talk about Ruby Frankie's plea and what happens next. Going through the formal plea agreement is what the court did today. This is a written plea agreement that includes a factual basis. She pled to a stipulated factual basis. The stipulated factual basis means that she is admitting the facts that are written in this document. And as I said, I went through those on YouTube. I'm not going to go through those in depth, but admitting to child abuse, um, including that the children were substantially harmed. They were restrained. They were um, subjected to conditions that were absolutely unconscionable. And they were told that they were possessed. They were told that they were evil. They were told that these punishments were brought about by their own behavior, among other horrific things. So this plea agreement starts, and for the audio audience, I'm going to the actual document of the plea agreement with the four counts that she is pleading to and has pled to. Two counts are being dismissed. Each count is a count of aggravated child abuse under Utah Code 76-5-109.2, uh, sections 2 and 3A. All four counts are second degree felonies. All four counts carry a um, minimum sentence of one year, a maximum sentence of 15 years in Utah State Prison. We're going to go through what the plea agreement entails. And this is signed by Ruby Frankie, so it is written in the first person. She signed this the morning of her plea. Plea agreement. My guilty plea is the result of a plea agreement between myself and the prosecuting attorney. All the promises, duties, and provisions of the plea agreement, if any, are fully contained in the statement, including those explained below. One, the defendant agrees to plea guilty as to counts one, three, five, and six. The state agrees to dismiss count two and four. The defendant shall submit to a pre-sentence investigation with adult probation and parole. The Department of Corrections will do a full report and recommend some term of prison time, and the judge will take that under consideration when the attorneys argue what the sentence should be. The defendant agrees to serve a prison term. The sentence received for counts one, three, five, and six are to be served consecutive to each other, meaning if the judge sentences her to the lowest possible minimum sentence, it would be one year on each count, and those would run after each other. So one year plus one year plus one year plus one year. And then whatever credits for the percentage of, of time that she would serve, whatever credits for the amount of time she served since her arrest, et cetera. But it wouldn't be concurrent where if you got one year on four counts, you would just serve one year because they all run at the same time. So if the judge sentences her to five years on each count, those will add one after the other. The judge is not being asked in this agreement, unlike other plea agreements that I've covered, to sentence her to something particular. In Murdaugh, and we recently saw this in Murdaugh, the agreement was for 27 years, and Murdaugh pled to more, like 16 some odd counts uh, to represent all of the different victims, but the agreed upon sentence was 27 years. In federal cases that we cover, this happens a lot where the agreement is that there will be certain conditions and the judge will then determine the sentence. That's what's happening here. The judge will determine the sentence, but whatever is sentenced on each count will be added to the sentence before it. The final part of this plea agreement is that the defendant agrees to testify truthfully against Jody Hildebrandt. And in return, the, the Washington County Attorney's Office agrees to remain neutral regarding future hearings before the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole. Meaning, depending on what her sentence is, she will be eligible at some point for parole, meaning she will get a reduction in her sentence and be released on supervision while she is out of prison. And the prosecutor's office won't argue that she should stay in custody, won't argue that she should be removed from custody. They will just remain neutral as to that. If she testifies truthfully against her co-defendant, Jody Hildebrandt. So before we move on, we are going to take a look at just a little bit of the court hearing wherein Ruby Frankie pled guilty. This hearing was only six minutes long. She was given her rights by the court. She waived her right to preliminary hearing, waived all her rights to trial. And we're going to go just to where 
she is pleading guilty before the court and the statement she makes while she is making that plea. Mr. Winward, we ready to proceed? We are ready to proceed. All right, then. <clears throat> Ms. Frankie, how do you plead to count one, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. To count three, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. To count five, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. And to count six, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. There is a factual basis set forth in the agreement that is a stipulated factual basis, counsel. That's correct, Your Honor. That is correct, Judge Walton. And that is Ruby Frankie not only pleading guilty, but also agreeing to that stipulated factual basis, which contains the specific factual allegations of what she did to her children and what she allowed Jody Hildebrandt to do to her children. Sentencing will be February 20th, and we will see how much time in prison she will get. But the court clarifies with the attorneys that they are not arguing over whether or not this is a prison case, meaning they are fully anticipating that she will serve some amount of time in prison. Remember, Jody has a hearing on December 27th. So will Jody take a plea deal? I don't know. Will the prosecutors go to Jody's defense attorney and be like, here is what Ruby has said about Jody. Here is her factual basis plea. Here is her lawyer's statement to the media saying that this is all Jody's fault. Here is the signed plea agreement. We are ready to go to trial against Jody. Are you ready? And I imagine Jody's attorneys will go back to Jody and say, okay, so um, if you go to trial, Kevin's going to testify against you. Ruby is going to testify against you. And who else has come out and spoken against you that might be called to speak against you in this context? So do I think Jody could take a plea deal on December 27th? I think that is a possibility. Absolutely. Could Jody just waive preliminary hearing and take more time? Absolutely. So I, I've taken pleas up to in the middle of trial. I've seen people take pleas after juries have come back. <laughs> when is it too late to plea? It just depends. It just depends. One of the hard things looking at this factual basis plea is that the victim children here were convinced by the co-defendants that they were evil and that they were possessed and that they deserved these punishments and these punishments were acts of love. It is something that deeply frustrates me about this case. It's something that is one of the reasons I don't cover a lot of cases where people harm their children. There's always some excuse in their mind that they come up with that causes, you know, aside from the physical damage, tremendous psychological damage to these children. So with Ruby taking this plea, these two victims will not have to testify against their mother in court. They will not have to hopefully be subjected to the inside of a courtroom with a jury trial and have to talk about the things that were done to them in front of a, a jury of adults. It's not an easy system. And we've heard that from victims and witnesses in a lot of the cases that we've covered. It's not an easy system to go through for those who have been harmed or for defendants. But defendants have a right to see the people testifying against them. That is a constitutional right. When it comes to those victims being children and being family members, it is a very, very difficult thing to do. So even though the prosecutors dropped two counts, am I bothered by that? No. Am I optimistic that Jody will take a plea and these children won't have to testify in court? I'm optimistic. Do I think that might give them an opportunity to start to heal without having to set foot inside of this courtroom because they're going to have to deal with family court? I am hopeful. I am hopeful that they are able to start to heal um, going forward. But if Jody goes to trial, the victims will be required to testify. Medical professionals will testify. Ruby and Kevin will testify um, and possibly others 
that are aware of Jody's behavior from the past, but that gets into a lot of nuanced discussion about pretrial motions and character evidence, and that is a conversation for another day, though an easier one to have truly with how horrific this case is. So as to Ruby's case, we are almost done. She will be sentenced on February 20th. She will serve some amount of time in prison. There won't be an appeal. This is a plea deal, and this will be done. As to her, we will know next week what happens with Jody. I hope for the sake of these victims that this is almost done as to both defendants. And with that, we are going to talk about another mother who says that she also very much loves her children. Thank you to today's sponsor, Thrive. I've got to be honest, my favorite holiday makeup is the makeup that will get me out of the door looking not tired the fastest because I'm normally running late. <laughs> and Thrive makes that easy because everything from their liquid lash extensions to their brilliant eye brightener is easy to wear, it doesn't get all over your face, and it's easy and quick to apply, which I love. The Brilliant Eye Brightener is what I use as eyeshadow, one, because it goes on in a stick. Two, it's basically a face crayon that I can blend with my fingers, and they have a lovely range of shades with everything from mattes to metallics, which are my favorites. And they have stocking stuffers for every makeup bag. And remember, for every product purchase, Thrives gives product and funds to over 300 giving partners to help communities thrive. It's in their name, Thrive Cosmetics, luxury beauty that gives back. And you can get 20% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash lawnard. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash lawnard. Let's get back to today's episode. Donna Adelson was recently arrested. I covered on last week's podcast, though pronouncing names horribly as I tend to do. I apologize for being very neurodivergent. I do my best. But between all of my neuro quirks and my dyslexia, there are times that it is just a struggle. So with all of that, Donna Adelson has been arrested and arraigned for the murder of Dan Markell. This has been ongoing since 2014. And her jail calls, well, some of them were recently made public. And she had a lot to say to Charlie on this jail call. But that's not the most fascinating part of the calls for me. And we're going to go over those jail calls in a minute. Some of the audio is a little rough. They are jail calls. It's just going to be like, you know, come with Emily to work day where we listen to jail calls and see what we take away from those calls. It's been a long time since I've listened to jail calls. So let's give a brief, brief road so far. For those of you that are newer to this case, that might be helpful. Charlie Adelson was recently convicted of and sentenced for the murder of Dan Markell. This is a murder for hire scheme where Charlie was convicted of hiring two hitmen through a middleman to kill Dan Markell. Dan Markell was married to Charlie Adelson's sister, Wendy. So Charlie through the woman he was dating, hired two hitmen. Those hitmen murdered Dan. Charlie was convicted. Charlie was just sentenced to multiple life sentences plus 60 or 90 years. All, all. He was sentenced to um, do not pass go, do not ever get out of prison again for the rest of your life. After he was convicted before sentencing, his mother, Donna, the victim's mother-in-law, Wendy's mother, was on quite a lot of jail calls with him. There's over 35 hours of jail calls after the conviction. On those jail calls, Donna indicated that she was uh, inclined to flee the country. We're going to hear some of that after I give you a rundown of the case, that she was inclined to either take her own life or flee the country. And she was arrested at Miami International Airport for the same thing that Charlie Adelson has been convicted of, which is murder, 
conspiracy to commit murder and solicitation for murder. So now that Donna, the mother of Charlie, the former mother-in-law of the victim, because the victim and Wendy had gotten divorced, Donna had a lot of feelings on this phone call. At one point, she breaks down sobbing. She talks about how frustrated she is with her daughter, Wendy. Wendy has interviewed with law enforcement numerous times, testified at trial, but has not been arrested. We will talk more about Wendy in other content if you are interested. Harvey, Donna's husband, the father of Charlie and Wendy, his cell phones have been taken and searched. Um, more search warrants were just on the court docket on December 15th regarding the cell phones of Harvey Adelson, who was also at the airport with his wife, Donna, getting ready to flee. What's interesting about this jail call is it starts as a call with her and Charlie. The line disconnects and Donna talks about not wanting to hang up the call because sometimes the call comes back. And so there's an open line that's still recording as Donna is talking to Harvey and others that are with her wherever she is. It seems that she's at the house um, having this conversation with Harvey and someone else in the background, but over an open recorded line while she's still on the phone. We are going to go through that phone call because there is some interesting stuff that I have not seen reported, or at least I find it interesting. And if you've never listened to jail calls before, they can be absolutely fascinating. And there's a few moments in there that I think prosecutors are absolutely going to use when Donna is prosecuted. Donna at her arraignment was already admonished for speaking back in court and is a, is a very interesting defendant in her own right. So we are going to listen to Donna Adelson's, some of her recorded jail call. Audio on jail calls is relatively tin canny. And I will say that this is not the entirety of the call. I will link that in the description of the episode below if you want to go listen to the whole call. These are excerpts from the call, but the call has not been edited. These are just excerpts from it and condensed for space so that you are clear that this is not the entirety of the 25 minute call just played through. Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from Charlie, an incarcerated individual at the Leon County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. To accept charges and consent to this recorded call, press one to re thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Every single call starts with, this is not a private call. This is recorded. It will be monitored. You know that you are being recorded. You know that these calls will be monitored. They used calls, lots of calls in Charlie's trial. This is not a surprise and or a secret. I am shocked about the amount of things people talk about on recorded jail calls. So at the beginning, they talk a little bit about the trial, and then we get Donna's feelings about the appeal and about Tallahassee. I'm playing it simply because I think it's funny that she seems to have a significant amount of disdain for the fact that this trial took place in Tallahassee and whether or not the appeal could be moved somewhere else. It's interesting listening to Charlie explain to Donna in this jail call that he thought that the judge was lenient with the defense and gave them a bit of the benefit of the doubt and that he believed after a conversation with his lawyer that the judge did that to avoid appellate issues and that if the judge ruled a bit more favorably to the defense that they would avoid more appellate issues it seemed to me that he was acknowledging that there aren't going to be a ton of appellate issues because the judge did his job and when the calls were close gave the benefit of the doubt to the defense and that's where this conversation is picking up. If, if there was an appeal, would it have to be in Tallahassee? Or can you move it? Because I don't understand why they wouldn't let you move it. I don't. It was blatantly, I mean, look, I have. Um, and that's Donna speaking, saying, I don't understand. It's blatant. I don't understand um, why they wouldn't let you move the appeal out of Tallahassee. Donna clearly doesn't understand how an appeal goes. I didn't say this to you before I picked up the phone, but there's a lot of things that we have to do and we've got a very tight time frame. So one of them involves taking care of some things for Roman. 
taking care of some things through Steinberg. It was just, Chad's been on the phone all day, and Susan was nice enough when I called her. She said, I'm going to gather everything up, and I'm going to drive down. So It's interesting that she's trying to talk to Charlie about his appeal, but then all of a sudden it goes to, we're on a very tight time schedule here. We have a lot of things to take care of. And then she starts talking about whether or or what things she has to take care of and how she's putting things in order and then starts talking about whether or not she would survive, whether or not she will flee the country. So she is talking about her preparations for who they need to talk to and what they need to do. At this point in the jail call, Charlie's side of the call has dropped and she is still talking to people at wherever she is. I'm assuming home, it could be elsewhere, but her husband is there and somebody else is there and she's having a conversation with them in the background. Go to prison. I can't. I can't push it. I'm not- and this is her speaking to whoever's in the background talking about Adelson, Charlie being in prison. She says for something he didn't do. And she says, I can't push it. I'm not that strong. And starts talking about what I think is her own probability of going to prison. Not that strong. And I also know how he, in a year and a half, his body and everything just slowly started to deteriorate. I'm old. I have a life. We have a great marriage. She says she knows how hard this has been for Charlie. His whole body is starting to deteriorate. And then she starts to take stock of her life. I'm old. I've had a wonderful life. We had a great marriage. But she's not talking to Charlie at this point. She is talking to Harvey and whoever else is at their house about what her plans are because she left the line open, hoping that Charlie would come back on the line so she didn't have to initiate a new call. There is an initiation fee to each collect call into custody. Um, It used to be like 6 or $7.00 her initiation, and then it was a per minute charge. So when the call cuts out, she's complaining that she doesn't want to have to call back because she doesn't want to have to initiate another call. So I think she's waiting for Charlie to pick back up the phone, but while she does, she's on an open recorded line talking to someone at her house, including her husband, saying, we've had a great life. It's fine. I'm not going to prison. I'm old. Happy, traveled, it was good. I'm really not unhappy. And I'm more than willing to just say goodbye. I'm more than willing to just say goodbye. Nothing painful. I just can't go to sleep. We bought our cemetery property a couple months ago. We're good. She says it doesn't have to be painful. We'll just go to sleep. We bought our cemetery plot a few months ago and starts talking about the fact that it's it's just handled. We'll just go to sleep. And then she starts talking to her husband, Harvey, about what that looks like. I'm good. What went into this weekend because I had I said something that made her feel like I had enough and I'm not going to watch. It's horrible. The trial going to go well. I know what I need to do. She said, I watched. The trial was not going to go well. I know what I need to do. But she also said to her husband, I'm good. She also sat in court at her arraignment when the prosecutor said that they were worried that she was considering harm. And she was like, No, I'm not. M- ma'am. They also listened to this jail call. Donna is talking about someone coming over to the house and being like, I know you're considering harm. Am I going to have to take care of everything? And this is her response to that. Am I doing fine? No. So she said, am I doing fine? No. Do I want to go to sleep and not see my son? That's where we're at in this call. To go to sleep and not see my son? I do. Perfectly honest, I do. We do, it we do it together. Leave a note. Don't know when to come in there. Her husband in the background says something about when will we do it? And she said, I know we'll do it together. And we'll leave a note and they'll know when to come and get us and we'll do it together. She's talking to her husband at this point. And we'll do it together. The boys. Look, gonna make a decision at some point. So after speaking to them this morning and knowing what they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. I really don't. 
She says to her husband, we have to make a decision. And after talking to Dan and knowing what they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. So she's talking about a plan B if they can't escape the country in time. So it's knowing what they're thinking up there. I'm, I'm assuming that she means about prosecuting her. This is right after her son's conviction. And she says, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. That's the conversation we're having. And she's telling her husband, we're doing this together. We'll leave a note. We bought the cemetery plot. But Dan said, you might, or you might do all of this, get to the airport, and they'll stop. And that could happen. It could happen. I don't know. But it's worth a try. To get to the airport is worth a try. I tried and tried and tried. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I've lost it. But I and she starts talking about how difficult it is to start making those travel arrangements. We're going to have to make a decision at some point. I don't know if we'll get out on time. This is why they sped up her arrest to arrest her at the airport. But she's very frustrated that they're holding her on a watch in custody. But this call is why they are holding her on a watch in custody because she's not done yet. Then she's talking to Harvey, not just about Wendy, but also about her plans, and she gets really upset. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Quip, for keeping mouths clean, even when my language gets a little bit dirty. This month, I wanna to talk to you about their incredible water flossers. I have a teen with braces, and getting food out of brackets is incredibly difficult without a water flosser. You guys know that filling this up with some warm water is my favorite way to floss, but it works wirelessly, so you're not fighting to try to find somewhere to charge it in the bathroom, so it's easy for everyone in the house to use, and it just recharges with the magnetic plug into the bottom of the water flosser. It's all in one. You can get the new water flosser tips sent directly to your house on a recurring subscription, just like all the other Quip products. And if you use their toothbrush, their mint and gum dispensers, and all of their other incredible products. You can get them all in matching colors and they have so many varieties. It's going to look good on the counter of your bathroom. So if you're ready to give it a try for yourself, you need to go to getquip.com slash Emily show for 20% off any electric toothbrush, mint and gum dispenser, or water flosser. That's 20% off any electronic toothbrush, mint and gum dispenser, or water flosser at getquip.com slash Emily show. That's G E T Q U I P dot com slash Emily show quit the good habits company. Let's get back to today's episode. And this is her now talking to her husband and whoever else is with them about the conversations with Charlie and texts that she and her daughter, Wendy, remember her daughter, Wendy is the ex spouse of the victim. They were going through a contentious divorce when this murder happened. And there was a lot of discussion about whether the motive for this was because Wendy wanted to move the children out of the Tallahassee area, down to Miami, closer to this part of the family. So I said, let me ask George. So I said, George, I can't get in touch with her. And she just told me my words. I can't get in touch with her. I believe that they are talking about Wendy because Donna then goes on to say, and she told me to have my lawyer call her lawyer. So this is now her starting to vent frustration with what's going on with Wendy. Remember, Wendy has testified at trial. Wendy has interviewed with police. Wendy has not been arrested. Her lawyer is about the case. And I regret it's not about the case. I have been reason. She was What's interesting is the parents realize that Donna and Harvey in this conversation together realize that Wendy's lawyer never told her not to speak to them. So Wendy has been telling her parents, my lawyer said I shouldn't talk to you. And the lawyer's like, I didn't say that. Oh boy. Lawyer, take the hint. Take the hint. Hey, Wendy said you said we couldn't speak to him. Well, we've we've had some conversations. When I said, I just got off with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know what oh, because I said, Yeah. You never we know you never ask anything about your brother. And she doesn't. And she told me it's because her lawyer said she shouldn't ask. But we, we found out it's not true. But we just got off the phone with him. My attorney took off. And he asked her attorney. Her attorney said, I never told her that. But I've never confronted him. No. So I wrote this last night. 
they are talking to a third party and there is a third voice in the background of this call. So it is Donna and Harvey and a third party that's having this conversation. And Donna is starting to vent about the fact that Wendy never asks about Charlie and he has just been convicted of hiring a hitman to murder her ex-husband, the father of her two children, but they are venting that Wendy doesn't ask enough about how Charlie's doing and that Charlie's been asking about her. And so Donna starts to read through text exchanges that she's having with Wendy. We know you never ask anything about your brother. This is eight o'clock last night, but we just got off the phone with him. And the first thing he asked was, how's Wendy holding up? I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called us or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up to phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. This is Donna texting Wendy. Your brother asks about you. Everyone's doing everything to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. Isn't that an interesting statement that she is making in text messages to Wendy? But wait, there's more. Again, I got another call from Charlie. And I said, just got off the phone with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know why we didn't speak. I told him a lie. I said, we're only speaking with you and Dan right now. I couldn't bear to tell him the truth. Your sister never even called us is the truth. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. You hear somebody in the background saying, yeah. Donna's saying, I thought she would be racing over here last night after the conviction but she didn't. Donna is very upset with Wendy's behavior. So now Donna is going to read in to the record because it's a recorded jail call, the text that she received back from Wendy. Um, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we don't. I'm not responsible in any way. Dear mom is how her text response starts. Dear mom, dear mom. <sighs> and then Wendy's text goes on to say, I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. We'll continue. Hey, for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. Say she was. When I was into What's hard to hear there is that the text from Wendy is, I did not have anything to do with Danny's death. Danny being Dan Markell, the victim here. And Donna says under her breath, I didn't say she was. And then it continues with Donna reading the text message. So Donna is reading the text message and giving commentary to the other people in the room with her about it by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. No, about the case, which is true. We've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. Not about the case, is it? Not what I said about her brother and that he wants. How are you, Wendy? How's my sister hold? So Donna's commentary on Wendy's text is, we're not trying to talk to you about the case. We're trying to talk to you about Charlie, who was just convicted for soliciting the murder of the father of your children. We're not talking about the case. So Donna's like, it's not about the case. And Donna's like, we've never talked about the case. We've never talked about the case. This isn't about the case. It sounds to me like Wendy is trying to set up some distance here and her mother is not at all respecting that boundary and is like but it's not about the case as we get into this you will see how much more donna doesn't think they're talking about the case she's just talking about fleeing the country it's not about a case wendy it's about her desire to flee the country to somewhere where there's no extradition things are totally different keeping in mind that Wendy is also a lawyer and was a law professor. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
If you have anything further to say about the case, please go through our lawyers. Right now, I have to be singularly focused on taking care of the boys during this difficult time. So I wrote back, okay, we have no desire to speak with you about the case. I guess Dad and I are just shocked that you didn't think of coming to see us or even calling us. We are your parents. We are and have always been there for you and the boys. None of what we wrote matters about the case. That's over. I just want you to know how many times Charlie is asking about you. Not only do you not ask about us, but not one question about Charlie, right? So Donna's mad that when Charlie was convicted, Wendy didn't drive right over to check in on Donna and Harvey and how they were doing or call them or ask them. She's not doing what Donna thinks that she should do. And then we get to Donna wanting some legal information from Wendy. So in the conversation, Donna is talking about passport photos and the visa and what needs to be done. And then talks about the fact that she wants to have more conversations with Wendy, not only to let Wendy know where their wills are and where their business things are, like it seemed to me where their arrangements were, but more. Downloaded. And the other thing I don't understand that my daughter could help me with, but we've been looking it up over and over because things change if there is extradition from Vietnam. Because we, we've looked at all the places. I mean, I could go to Korea and China, but there's no extradition. But we're looking for places where there's no extradition. Who? Donna is saying the thing I need my daughter's help with because it keeps changing and I've been looking it up over and over and over is if there's extradition from Vietnam. And yes, I'm aware I could go to Korea or go to China, but is there extradition from Vietnam? Why won't she help me with that? It's a legal matter. It's not about the case. Oh, and this is where Donna starts to rant about the fact that Wendy is not really being grateful enough to them. Really? Maybe she knows about. Maybe she can look up the extradition issue yeah. before we waste, waste our time. She can tell on you that my parents are And the third party voice said, "But is she going to tell on you that my parents are thinking of leaving?" That's what the other person asks them. But is Wendy going to dime you out? that you are thinking of fleeing the country to somewhere that does not have extradition. That's what their whoever friend is asking them. Okay, but if you mention it to Wendy, is Wendy gonna tell somebody? Well, if you tell her beforehand, I need to tell you something. Is as, Wendy as an going to tell? doesn't talk and has nothing to do with- And she says, I need to tell her beforehand, I need to talk to you as an attorney who doesn't talk. She is trying to now establish attorney-client privilege with her daughter, who she wants to help her figure out where she can flee to, where she won't get extradited back to the US for, to be prosecuted for the murder of her grandchildren's father that her son was just convicted of. With the case, it just has to do with mom and I and some decisions that we have to make. Uh, yeah, I know you want to bring her up and show her wherever. So now she's telling Harvey, this is what you need to tell Wendy, that we just need to talk to you some things about mom and I and some decisions we have to make, and then start saying we need to get her to come over to the house and show her where everything is. We have a safe with combo. She needs to know everything. She is. She gets, it's a plane crash. No one's going to know where anything is or who belongs to what. So I would like her to come up here so she could see it. I don't think that's asking too much. She can live three hours away. Every oh. time she says, can you do this? Can you come here? Can you do this? Yeah. Everything. How many times do we have plans that I really can't and have to cancel? Wendy needs us for this. Wendy needs us to babysit. So we've been really good nannies. And I oh, guess yeah. our job is up. Because now the boys are older. They can go out with friends. They can do things on their own. So she doesn't need grandma and grandpa. OK, pretty hurtful. I have one son that I don't speak with. I have one son who's supposed to be dead. And my daughter, whom I love, is doing this. I don't get it. I don't get it. I said, 
And this is where Donna starts to break down saying, I have one son that doesn't speak to us, one son that is practically dead, and a daughter I love who does this. They're like, how how dare she is the vibe that I'm getting from Donna. And then Donna gets into, and you're going to have to listen carefully, because Donna says, this is what I hear in this call, are something about their family being cursed, and I don't know how to take care of it anymore. Let me know if that's what you hear too in this part. Barbara, I swear to God, our family was cursed. Absolutely cursed. And I don't know how to take care of it anymore. So, I swear to God, our family was cursed. Cursed. And I don't know how to take care of it anymore. And then she breaks into sobs. I can imagine the prosecutor using this as the theme of their case for this trial. So you've always tried to take care of it then, Donna. And when you couldn't have your grandchildren and your daughter where you wanted them, you tried to take care of it because they are going to try Donna for solicitation of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and murder because they are going to allege that she was trying to take care of it. And if I were the prosecutor on this case, I would absolutely use this, this call against her. But this call has already been used against her. This call that was being monitored after Charlie's conviction is what led to her arrest at Miami International Airport. She talks about making arrangements. She talks about going to sleep and just being done. She talks about maybe not having enough time to get out. She talks about trying to establish an attorney-client relationship with Wendy, her daughter, to try to figure out where the best country to flee to would be that didn't have extradition. And whoever else is in that room is like, but is Wendy going to tell law enforcement on you? That's the conversation. So absolutely, this jail call is not only what got her arrested, but I see this being used in her prosecution because the context is different than earlier calls. The context of this call is after Charlie was convicted and facing down multiple life sentence for what she has now been arrested for. And Donna is still mad at how could her children do this to her after she was trying to protect Wendy. This call is absolutely going to come up more. I hope that playing portions of it and giving you kind of my take on how this will be used against her, because anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And it doesn't matter if you are leaving an open line. Charlie's not even on the phone anymore, and she leaves an open recorded line while she's having a conversation with other people in the room. If that's what she says on a recorded line, I will be very interested to see what they turn up from all the cell phones and other digital devices that they have taken and are now searching since the conviction. What were they saying since the conviction? What were the Google searches? Because she said, I've been searching and searching. What were the Google searches, Donna? Luxury prisons for rich people? Are you like Corey Richens? Is that what you're Googling? Or were you Googling non-extradition countries? How to get a visa? Because in this call, they also talk about trying to find a fake address to put on the visa so they can leave the country. All of that Googling is also going to come up in this prosecution. I'm going to keep an eye on this one. I know that you're interested. I am also interested. But Donna, uh, yeah, Donna, Donna, is a very interesting and angry woman. And with that, thank you all for being here. Thank you for being Lawnards. I hope you have a restful and happy holidays. I know that the topics of conversation today were not too helpful. If you haven't been following me along on the YouTube channel, we are having a Lawnard holiday party and talking about food court. So come over and have a giggle. There will be some new episodes that have not been on the podcast before for you during the holiday times about all of the audacity. It's just episodes of audacity, hopefully so that you can just shake your head and be like, well, you know, we might have made some mistakes in my life. Things happen, but damn, there are people out here doing this. 
And I hope that that just gives you a giggle through the holidays. That's the goal of the next few episodes of The Emily Show. And then we will be back in the new year with a whole docket full of cases. I appreciate you. The members will be getting a kind of recap of 2023 and a look ahead at 2024 in their member spaces. If you want to find out more about that, you can check it out on the YouTube channel, on the app. You guys, have a happy holidays. Have a happy new year. Thank you. This this has been an incredible and continues to be an incredible honor to get to break down these cases for you every single week. I hope you and yours are well this holiday season. It can be a very difficult time of year, but know that you always have community here and I am with you. We are keeping it quiet this year. And if that's what you're choosing to do too, I hope it's an absolute delight. I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search your app store for Law Nerd. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.